are so excited to welcome Mark Davis, with over 25 years in deploying new technologies and innovative solutions with Fortune 500 government and academic research client. Mark Davis currently leads Mobileye's North America data service business. Mark has led the introduction of several platform technologies in areas ranging from climate change research to commercial risk management to industrial process control solutions. With a long background in remote sensing and geospatial analytics, Mark draws from his experience to address some of the transportation sector's biggest safety and operational challenges. Uh -huh. Mobileye is partnering with key DOTs, MTAs, and transportation sector service providers and researchers to help deliver a positive impact for society in terms of railway planning, safety, mobility, and equity. And Mark has held uh, senior executive positions at top VC-backed uh, startups to multi-billion giant. Mark holds a Master of Science Management of Technology degree from Georgia Institute of Technology. And with no further ado, I would like to hand things to Mark to give a little bit context on who he is, what he does, before introducing Zilin and getting the talk to kick off. So Mark, over to you. Sure, thanks, Janie. And if I can share the screen, I think that helps to show a couple of slides to what, what we've been up to. But you know, my background, as Janie said, I've been in remote sensing most of my career. So taking new innovative sensors and then how do you get them into practice into the commercial and government academic sectors. And more recently over the last, I guess now five years have been with Intel. Um, well, a lot of people think of Intel as more of a, a chip and technology manufacturer also has a big group for artificial intelligence and five years ago invested in uh, Mobileye and Mobileye is a world leader and uh, collision avoidance safety technologies for, for cars installed on over 350 different car models and in many different brands. And, and really what it's pulling together is, is sensing technologies, analytics, um, and transportation efforts to basically make our roads safer. And in the long-term goal of Mobileye is to be basically provide the auto manufacturers a fully autonomous stack um, for uh, autonomous driving vehicles. So while today you see things like uh, collision, uh, not collision avoidance, you, you see things like adaptive cruise control, blind spot warnings, lane assist, those things and all the, if any of you have the newer cars, almost all the new cars have these advanced safety features. Um, in the future, there'll be more and more driving by the cars themselves. Um, but in the meantime, this data that we're collecting could be used by researchers like at, at NYU to understand where are there high risks uh, on the roads, you know, work zone impacts, you know, uh, planning, things like that. Um, so anyway, so if I can share real quick, I'll just do two more things. Uh, let me see, Janie, can I make this? Here we go. All right. Share. And just two slides quick so everyone can see this. All right, so as I mentioned, so you know, Mobileye, the uh, automotive safety technology going towards fully autonomous vehicles. And then in the meantime, there's a lot of data to get there. So just, just I'm gonna be presenting next week. So this was good timing at the uh, intelligent transportation system. But this slide here shows what's happening under the hood. This is actually in New York. I'll show you another one in New York. Under the hoods of cars today. So there's camera system right behind the, the rear view mirror that is, has, and then there's a chip with analytics on it that it has been trained to pick up things like stop signs and roadway markings and pedestrians and bicyclists and work zones and lots of things. Um, at the same time, it's, it's looking at the headway. You see that blue line, which is looking at, which is a safety feature, you know, how, how far are you in front of the vehicle or the person or a biker in front of you? And if it's the trajectory is such that it's, you know, a collision is imminent, you know, say within the next few seconds, then the alerts go off in the car, the car manufacturers, you know, uh, employ the automatic braking and things like that. So this data that's, you don't see this as a consumer or a driver of the vehicles, but it's under the hood is being sent to the cloud. So this is today. And then if you think in the future, where is this all going? So again, in the streets in New York City, this is a, some tests we've been doing. So basically not only having this information, but then controlling the driving of the car, you can see in the bottom right, this is a Ford driving around with just a, 
a safety driver watching but not actually doing anything. And what's happening is on the left-hand side, this base map from all the cars you know, that have been crowdsourced driving around the city are given information about the rules of the road, where the lanes, where the crosswalks and signage and stuff like that. And then this particular car has lots of sensors. So there's radar sensors, LIDAR sensors, visual sensors, um, and then the controls that control the cars. So this, this is where this technology is going. And then maybe I'll stop there and then we can, we can keep going. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much to give us some brief idea of what you and mobile are doing and you know what are the vision based technology uh, that can be implemented for connected and automated vehicles. And I know Zilin has also worked on many machine learning deep learning based transparent solutions. And I would like now like to introduce our student moderator Zilin Bian. Uh, Zilin is a PhD candidate in transparent planning and engineering in the Department of Civil and Urban Engineering at New York University. He received a master degree in University of Florida. He is currently working as a graduate research assistant at NYU while pursuing his doctorate degree. His research interests include applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence in traffic incident management, transparent data, and mobility modeling and prediction. With that, I will hand things over to Zilin and Mark to carry us forward. All right, thank you, Jenny, um, for introducing me. Yeah, I'm glad to uh, serve as the moderator for today's chatter. So yeah, <clears throat> uh, just talking about, I think uh, Mark mentioning about that uh, mobile eye has like uh, been dedicated for the improving the roadway uh, safety, especially for the automated vehicles. So I would like to actually expand that for a little bit. So Mark, uh, so given that say right now, uh, there are like studies claiming that for the autonomous vehicles, they can have this, um, uh, you know, the ability to reduce more than like 90% of the crash in helping uh, improve the roadway uh, safety. So what kind of role do you think that uh, the AV, I mean, the autonomous vehicle can play in addressing the uh, road safety? Yeah, and I think obviously with regulation, I think it'll be a while before we see fully autonomous vehicles just driving around our streets, right? You have to have the, the Department of Transportation has to have a level of comfort that all the safety mechanisms and redundancies are in place. But as I showed in those first few slides, the most of the almost all new models of cars today are having more and more sensors that are sort of scanning the roadways and looking for safety indications, you know, just like the simple example of a blind spot indicator. So now using this information, which the Department of Transportation are just beginning to use this crowdsource data from all these cars. If you can imagine every time there is a collision warning event that goes off, if you start aggregating that, that's probably an area that the, the safety planners might wanna look at is, is the crosswalk faded or is the signage not correct or is the speed limit too high? So I think the, the roles that these newer technologies can play right now today is informing indications that in the past was much harder to get before you'd have to send students out to the street with clipboards and count the number of cars driving by, the number of people crossing the street or very sophisticated sensors that they would put on cars to scan the roadways, let's say to produce a, a 3D model of the street. And so this crowdsource data enables you to get that in almost real time, much more data. And, and so then there's a lot more, so I'd say scientific questions that you can look at where before you just did not have the information. And then I think moving forward, um, you know, the, how are the lanes are being used? What is the average speed? Where are these collision warning events going off? That's just, it's, it's being much more proactive in road safety. And, and just so you, people know on, on this call, currently when people are addressing road safety, typically they'll look at fatalities and accidents over the last five years. So they'll accumulate data just over five years. So it's very reactive and they have to go back five years because they have to get enough information to be statistically significant. So now flip that on its head, you're looking proactively in the collision warning events you have many, you know, orders of magnitude more information that you can use aggregated from just the cars driving on the street. So I think it's the main role I see it playing is it being much more proactive in how we can improve things versus waiting for fatalities, you know, or, or injuries. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. 
So yeah, I think um, my next question you kind of like answered that uh, in the in the previous one, but I still want to raise that. So basically, in the few slides, uh, the first few slides you just show that uh, that like the car view, uh, like what kind of the car is kind of like seeing through the camera uh, on the street. So that actually um, requires like technologies for like the uh, computer vision or the vision based approaches to collect the data. So. Right now, I, I think you just mentioned that we are sitting on the uh, the area of the big data. I mean, there are tons of available data from like different sources, uh, and uh, you know, as the uh, perspective of the transportation, uh, what kind of like the role do you think for that data plays uh, in the future of the transportation? Yeah, and I think there's never going to be one single answer for the data. If you think of the cars, it's looking through windshield like a human. But then what, what groups are looking at now, there's aerial data. So there's services that are basically with a high resolution, very sophisticated cameras, you know, scanning our roadways across the country about once a year. Also very high density LIDAR data, but it's a very static, like once a year, but it's good resolution and spatial accuracy. Um, the other thing that's happening, you have more and more uh, intersection cameras and cameras around, let's say the roadways. Now, some of those are very sophisticated, also have um, analytics and machine learning algorithms that are counting people and counting your misses and those things, but that's only as good as where you can install those on those intersections. And it's a pretty costly you know, value proposition. Um, and then you have now what's coming is, is like the, they call it D to X. So basically this, the, the infrastructure is talking to the cars and cars are talking to each other. So imagine uh, an example, we driving down the highway, you hit a very uh, high fog area. So your car's sensors are blinded because the visibility is really bad. If you could transmit that to the cars behind you, they are gonna start slowing down so you don't have these pileups. Or if your traction control is going off because it's icy, telling the cars behind you. So all this stuff is coming together, it's sort of the geolocation accuracy, the, the visual information, as well as other types of sensors, you know, coming together. So that's where the future could be, but it's, <laughs> we're a ways from that right now. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. So uh, yeah, for uh, my next question could be like, so uh, for the vehicle right now, it's, uh, say for the autonomous vehicle, it's like running on the road. So you just mentioned that too. So for, for example, it has uh, the communication to talk like to like the uh, infrastructure, or like uh, the pedestrian or uh, some like moving uh, objectives. So my next question is for the urban infrastructure. So how do you think that kind of uh, the urban infrastructure can shape the way uh, for the, uh, the AV program uh, operates? Yeah, so I would say that in the urban infrastructure, especially in New York City, there's lots of CCD cameras. There's many cameras and there's lots of information. And so then melding in the, the information from cars, as an example, in New York, all the Ubers that are driving around New York City have mobile technology. So you have, you know, black cars, Uber vehicles and, and passengers cars collecting this data. So how, how can you string this together to get new insights? And I would say a, a close one that we're seeing across the country is, is work zones. So there's a new work zone data exchange that they're looking at common formats, common methods, common information that both researchers, the industry, as well as commercial public companies could use to try to get smarter about work zones. And the reason that's happening is when there is a work zone, it impacts, it causes you know, traffic delays and congestion, which also causes secondary accidents. So I think we're seeing that as sort of the first example and where you can have cones at work zones that are communicating to the cloud that people are working, watch out, slow down, and communicating that to fleet vehicles. So I think that'll only get deeper and deeper to where instead of just communicating to trucks, hey, a work zone is coming, slow down, communicate to individuals in their cars, and ultimately you could communicate to people walking on the streets, you know, watch out, there's a speeding car coming, you know, don't step out in the crosswalk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, as for, for that, Part of the question like the work zone stuff uh i've been actually uh, uh doing a little bit of research for like uh work zone management or those kind of things so i've been knowing very well about like how hard for like the workers were uh collecting the data for the work zones uh, from the field or from the camera i mean the street camera or those kind of stuff 
So yeah, uh, for me, if I like uh, want to construct some uh, research prediction modeling uh, using like the real work zone data. So right now, uh, I mean, other than like the AV uh, or like the vision based collecting, uh, those kind of fancy data collect uh, those stuff, like they are like very limited data uh, for the traditional part to help the prediction of the, uh, the work zone uh, approaches or those kind of the research problems. So yeah, I, I definitely think that uh, the AV is also like uh, uh, can serve a really good role in helping like uh, managing and uh, uh, detecting or improving the safety of the work zones. So and one thing that, just to clarify, when we think of like crowdsource connected vehicle data, right? Not from intersection cameras or from in infrastructure, but from cars themselves, whether it's fleet vehicles or OEMs, think of it as there's cameras, roadway observations, just like a person, they can see out their windshield. And so you get the control devices and work zones and hazards and collision warnings. But then there's, a, there's another piece of data that's also out there, which is the telematics or the vehicle information itself. How fast is the car going? What's its trajectory? What's how are you are your seatbelts on? Are your windshield wipers on? Those kind of things. So I think from a research perspective, sort of the vastness of data that's available now that wasn't just a few years ago is it, really improving, you know, almost daily now. Yeah. Um, so right, yeah. So basically for um, especially again for on this uh, on the top of this works on topic yeah right now I think for the traditional like researchers they also would like to use like the traffic flow data the collecting from the uh, like the remoting sensors or like the Bluetooth sensors or like the uh, the tow tag uh, data to kind of try to reflect how the work zone is impacting the traffic flow on the road okay. so I think yeah but that one is kind of like the macroscopic level. So for the AV, they can try to dig in to find a very good resolution on the microscopic level on the road to try to reflect more accuracy or those kind of stuff. So uh, talking about that, actually, one of the uh, uh, question that I'm thinking of is so uh, especially for me, like when I when I'm doing this uh, research problem for the uh, for the work zone, I have this issues for like. I mean, using like try try to using like the vision uh, vision based approaches to detect the work zone. So for the road uh, right now, the the two uh, images that contains the cones or like the barri uh, barricades uh, in the in the road is kind of like limited for us to collect. So how do you guys kind of like uh, solve uh, resolve that part of the issue, like uh, detect those uh, like special uh, objects uh, using like the images or like those technologies yeah. yeah so you're you're hitting on one of the other questions about you know one of the biggest challenges in ai <laughs> right so taking this work zone example you know right now work zones look and feel very different across the country or let's say especially in new york city right is it a sign that says work zone ahead or are there cones or there are, are there ropes or, or you know diversions and things so currently in, in the vehicles that have mobile eye technology, we're looking for certain cones, certain signs, certain attributes that would say, hey, we think this is a work zone. And also another challenge with work zones is they're transient, right? They move, they, they yeah. come alive and now they're done, then they fix the potholes and then they go away. So you have to have measure the, the, how often you're seeing it over a period of time that needs to expire. Um, so that's another thing. So having crowdsource data that, hey, I saw it and the, the last 10 cars saw it. So I feel I have a confidence that that's there. And then the, the next thing is if you just indicate that, and maybe I want to back up, there's a, something we didn't hit on is privacy, right? That if we're just scanning all these roadways, people are concerned that you're tracking where I'm going and I'm going to the store, then to my house or my apartment or whatever. And so because of privacy rules around connected vehicle data, a, a lot of that data is chopped up and anonymized. So we, you don't have ex, an exact vehicle path or tracing. And so when we're doing work zones, we're just getting indications that, hey, this looks like a work zone. But the best way to have a, a level of confidence, if you could get the image to say, oh, yeah, look, I can see the cones. I see the work truck. So some some. Uh, data is available from certain vehicles where you can get an image that is when a work zone indication is is noted 
send images to validate that, have a human validation that yes, that's a work zone. So for research purposes, that's good. And then at the same time, the cities and their, their permitting system, they may say, hey, I think there's a work zone here. So looking for differences between what's permitted and not permitted or some of the projects that we're working on today. But I, the, the last thing I'll say on this is when there's AI that's put on a chip in a car because we're doing edge-based compute, to, you know, we're not sending all these images back every time because that would be massive, you know, data exchange, that, that AI has to be on the chip. And so if you create a new AI algorithm to look for this kind of new magic cone or this kind of indication, which is a works on a scene in New York City, that's not on all the crowdsourced cars or all the cars that are driving around. And so one, a challenge to answer your question four was, how can you continue to have the AI advancing? Because it's, it's easy to do machine learning and analytics if you have enough data and you have some training data, but getting it onto those cars is tougher. And so I think right. there be some ways to continually update this information as people come up with new analytics. Yeah, I mean, definitely like narrow down uh, for like the huge high performance computation uh, power into like this chip is like a challenging topic. And but I think right now, like uh, uh, for the chip uh, companies or like the technologies, uh, those kind of like have this uh, unit of calculation like TOP, like really high TOP of doing like calculation power or those stuff to be able to like solve those cutting edge problems. So my next question is, uh, as also you mentioned that sitting like uh, resolving uh, the cases for the work zones is complicated. So let's expand that view to a little bit larger, say for the New York City. So it's, it is a complex uh, transportation system and you know, like the roads, uh, like uh, complex and the pedestrians like a uh, random on the road. Uh, so basically it's like a uh, placing uh, autom autonomous vehicle like pilot uh, on the in, the, in, in the New York City is very challenging. So uh, that can, kind of like lead to my next question is, so what are the biggest challenges to like the CAV or I mean the AV vehicles when you guys like do uh, the operates or like any deployments in the New York City you have ever met uh, through this? Uh, we, uh, it, we've been we've been actually testing in New York City, so it may not be technology wise as, as hard as you think. Um, one is you know we'll we'll put some underlying maps which are like the rules of the road. I can turn left here. This is a one way. This is the lane. So that's just an underlying base map that is telling the car, this is where we think you can drive, but it's not gonna only look at that. And then if you have vision-based sensors, what you can see, which, is, but then you could have LIDAR sensors from a distance, right? That you have a much better spatial uh, understanding on where the car is versus people or curbs and other vehicles. And then a, a radar as well for, from the sides and from different angles. So I think it's combining multiple sensing types that are that are independent so you can have redundancy um, to, to get there so i think even in very complex we're driving around the streets of, of tel aviv and israel we're talking new york city and other places there's a bunch of you know autonomous car companies testing around pretty you know complicated areas so i think that's there it's more about how do you instill confidence? Like, would you get in one right now <laughs> in the back of a seat in a car driver in New York City? I think I would still be pretty nervous at the moment, but uh, you know, it's coming. Yeah, so talking about that. So basically how, say, how can you, uh, or to validate or to say, what is the time point you can say you are confident to uh, operate to a car uh, in, the, uh, in a very uh, complicated transportation system, usually, uh, as far, as far as I know, that like uh, the AV companies, they like to test their um, uh, the autonomous vehicles operations in the simulation environments, right? So my next question is like, it's, this is a little bit uh, research perspective, but I know like uh, simulating the AV in the uh, in the environment kind of like has different uh, uh, perspectives. Like uh, usually. They are like game engine uh, driven uh, simulation platform, and they are also like the visual. Uh, uh, I mean the uh, the visual enhancement um, uh, based simulation. So they are also like uh, the artificial uh, enhancement or like uh, artificial augmentation uh, simulation. So uh, what do you think, or 
uh, how do you compare like these different simulation platforms and uh, uh, what do you think which one is kind of like good, better or good? Yeah, and, and my, my side of the business is really on the data versus how Mobileye is tackling the you know, fully autonomous approach. There, there's actually a great talk by our CEO, which was a professor, you know, came out of, of Israel that was at CES this year. So talking about sort of his view on where this is going. But I, I think we are, while we of course do all sorts of simulations, how can you trick the cars and, you know, run under different scenarios to do lots of tests. We are doing real world testing in cities. Now there's a safety driver there, so, but it just, the, the vehicles are driving themselves. So we're doing a lot of that in the real world. That's the best way to learn. It's a, you know, situations that you wouldn't expect and potentially in your models. Um, so that's probably my best answer on that. There was a question earlier, I just want to answer quick. Uh, Robert asked about, you know, you don't always have good cellular communication or let's say GPS signals as, as well, especially when it's blocked by big buildings in a city like New York City. But at least from the data collection perspective, our sensors are always collecting in the data. And then if there's not a cellular connection, when there is one, then it pushes that packet up. So it's, it's you know, we, we drive obviously lots of places in the country that you don't have cell connection. So it's, it's stored on the vehicle and it basically in the car until it, it can unload that package. So um, I don't know, Lisa, there's another question that came out. It says there's a question about how do we calibrate in, in the measurement of the actual distance. I, I think that's asking about the headway to the vehicle in front. So it's one is I'm definitely not the one to answer that. But when we're looking at headway, you know, based on the speed of the car and it, it's a vision based approach. So we're not using LIDAR. I mean, a LIDAR approach for, for looking at distances is much more accurate but we're using a spatial technique with it's been, and there's a bunch of papers written on that, um, is whether there's 3D information has been extracted or processed 2D information applied. So what I was showing earlier today is, is not 3D, that's all, you know, 2D works. You know, in the future, we're looking at LIDAR and more of the 3D information. Um, great small device. Uh, quite the last question was mobilize system integrate to the back end for unified processing. Yeah, so so obviously when for when it's controlling the vehicle. So right, uh, actually one one clarification. That's a good question. Is we provide these sensing technologies and then we really give it over to the car manufacturers. So if they're going to control their automatic braking, or currently right now, we'll give the indication on that. Hey, if if you don't in the next two point three seconds, if you don't have a change, you know the the, the the driver is going to crash. And so then they'll use that information for their automatic braking and how hard to put on the brakes and those things. So we're working hand in hand with the car manufacturers. I'll turn it back to you, Zimran. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. So yeah, actually I have like uh, two more questions to ask actually for, uh, I think I, I also mentioned that before. So basically for the research perspective, like what kind of like the research needs uh, for the mobile aisles, the mobile eyes, uh, and what kind of the roles does the research play uh, in mobile aisles overall strategy uh, today? Sure, and I'm going to answer that from a. Um, I want to pull up one of my slide here. Yeah. From a, a more uh, selfish perspective, right? Because there's there's mobile eyes. So our all of our R and D and a lot of the corporate development occurs out of our headquarters in Israel. And so the, the fancy uh, research around LiDAR sensors and radar sensors and that, you know, fully autonomous driving capabilities is there. And what, what I would speak to is, and maybe I'll share a slide real quick to, to answer that question. Yeah. Hold on, let me shrink this. So, the, all right, oops, not that one. Right here. I think everyone can see that. So this, we, we gave a presentation a couple months ago at, at the Transportation Research Board, which is the research group that funds a lot of the DOTs and gets a lot of money from the federal government. And so one of the questions you know, with that group, and then we're actually posing next week again in, in Los Angeles for the ITS is, 
you know, what are some of the research opportunities? And so here were the ones that we came up with from a data perspective. And this, this ties to improving road safety and infrastructure. So one is, you know, these collision warnings that are being captured from cars all over the country, how can this data be used to augment road risk assessment? Right, so it, instead of the old school way of, of counting accidents or, or counting fatalities. So this, surprisingly enough, uh, I was in a, in a presentation with a federal agency and they were talking about having an app for if you almost get in a, an accident, you know, you can report it in an app. One is the number of people <laughs> who do that is probably next to none. And I was like, why would you do that? Just get the data that's coming off the car. And so that, that was the first one. Um, the other is, is road asset data. So this is whether it's signage or are there guardrails and the markings, there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, obviously you're designing a road to be as safe as possible, but over time that changes, you start having degradation in the pavement or the signage aren't visible anymore, um, or the curve is too sharp or whatever. So, so one is because we measured the roadway geometries and a lot of the infrastructure, that was another question. Um, there, this, this next one is a, is a really good one, I, I think. So by uh, September 30th of 2026, basically all state DOTs, all 50 states across the country have to basically be uh, compliant with this. It's called Meyer 2.0, the model of inventory roadway elements. So it, it's by understanding the roadway inventories better, as well as all this other safety information, they, the government feels that we can do a better job of, of improving roadway safety. So there's, there's 37 mandated elements and about 200 other ones, but it's very time consuming and difficult to get this information or costly if you just have to send a LIDAR truck down the road to get it. And so could you use crowdsourced or connected vehicle data to not only get this information, but maintain it and, and give indications? So that's the third one. VRUs, obviously New York City, vulnerable road user. That's what that's speaking to. You know, where are they at risk, you know, or not using the crosswalks or they need, need to have better bike lanes and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of money going from the government now, it's particularly, you know, named from the infrastructure bill to help uh, vulnerable road user improve road safety for, you know, all users, not just cars. The work zone, as we already talked about, and then any of this before and after, a lot of times now is someone will have great ideas or there'll be research that I think this will work, but they have no real easy way to understand if, if what you came up with it, it was an impact. And so now by using connected vehicle data, much more uh, highly available data, you know, from a, a frequency perspective, now you can do a study before and after, do temporary changes and see if it worked, or if you've done modeling and scenarios that you think this is going to improve, let's say, traffic through the Lincoln Tunnel. You could, you know, make some changes and understand that almost, you know, in a very short period of time versus having to wait five years and realize it didn't work. <laughs> so th those are coming some of the research questions. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely for the uh, the, the research part, um, it's kind of like the uh, the future road uh, roadmap, and yeah, definitely for like the state DOTs, they are trying also to adapt into the new uh, power set of the old fashion. <laughs> I can I can sense that definitely when I when I'm working with the uh, DOT guys. So uh, yeah, actually another question uh, which is uh, I think is like um, popular or like interesting. Uh, like we from the students' perspective, we would like to know basically. Uh, right now, you know, like the CAV is a hot topic and everyone tried to like, uh, I mean, many students that are very interesting, like to get a job to uh, in this area. So my next question is what practical skills are useful to working uh, to work at mobile aisle, mobile eye, uh, is that, you know, like just in case they get a chance to uh, for the high opportunity uh, for the actual company. Yeah, and, and so let's just so maybe i'll speak first with in the united states so mobileye in the us has sort of two divisions one is the data division which which i lead for how can we accumulate and use this data in smarter ways and work with the dot's or the, the city authorities and then we have we, we have the hardware side of it which is an aftermarket that we put basically this camera technology onto fleets 
that are older vehicles that don't have all this built in. So we can basically retrofit an older fleet vehicle to make them safer. Um, and so that group, you know, sometimes we're doing studies with these big fleet companies or the new EV trucks or new bus manufacturers. They want to see, is this going to impact their overall, you know, driving performance and safety? So from a, a research perspective, I would say, you know, or, or let's say a hiring perspective, you know, I'd, I'd like to see more intern work on key studies because a lot of this stuff we're talking about here, I'm going to show, let me show one more quick just to give you an idea. Sure, sure. All right, right, this, this one here. So I, I'm not a, a transportation engineer or safety engineer. So this, this was in a fairly urban, this is in New Jersey, Middlesex County, which was an area where they had the highest fatalities over the last year. And so we just took collision data, I'm sorry, collision warning data and said, hey, here's, here's a hotspot. We looked at the whole county, but this was just an area as an example. And so a lot of stuff going on here. And so if you just look at these, here was 74 near misses on this road segment, 59 here. Okay, why is that? So the research questions are for this data to be used and I think to help improve our roads, researchers are gonna need to validate that this does correlate to risky driving behaviors or risky roadway segments or, or the traffic control devices are incorrect or this road geometry, this one very well may be the road geometry is weird. So it's causing all sorts of confusion as people are going through this intersection. And so they're, you know, getting an, almost getting an accident. But I think this new, you know, for those interested in data and analytics, you know, how can this data get into practice versus its theories or ideas? And so, we're, you know, we're, we're just getting ready to start a project down in Florida in, in the temp area where they're going to do some research to validate some of this uh, crowdsource data against historical, you know, approaches. Um, so there, there's areas there. And then I think from the data, we do spit out imagery. I don't have a picture of that now. But for people that are interested in more AI and the machine learning to pick out things, there's lots of data sources and, and I think scientists, I'm mean, scientists, researchers that are interested in coming up with better analytics that could go into cars. That's another area of, of hot topic and hot interest. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, uh, I think I got all the questions answered and uh, that's very interesting. So I will actually hand over back uh, to uh, Jenny for the Q&A session. So Jenny, it's your turn. Thank you, Zilin. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for the conversation. I really enjoyed the conversation. And we do have several questions from the Q&A. And I think Mark has kind of answered the first two on the list already. But I do have a follow-up question uh, about uh, the second one, which I think it was Fan was asking about the calibration and measurement of the actual distance. So just curious, uh, and I think I would direct this question to Mark you. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenge we have in the New York City Connected Vehicle Pilot is the accuracy of the vehicle location. And, you know, especially in a very complex urban environment like New York City uh, with all these buildings, as you mentioned. So just curious about, you know, you kind of touch on how mobile eye is handling. If there's no signal, no serial data, the GPS, you know, package will be uploaded later on. But just curious on like how, your company are, or based on your experience, how are you dealing with the accuracy issues? Not about you know uploading the data later, but um, just the, the sure. accuracy of the vehicle location. And do you have any vision on you know how to ensure the data collected and um, like what your company is doing are good, sufficient, and probably with minimal errors? All right, so uh, now I understand. So thanks for clarifying that, Jenny. So, so one is, the accuracy, let's say the geolocation accuracy of our information, whether where we put a stop sign on the side of the road or where we stick the traffic lights or whatever, is only is it's actually uh, only a little better than the GPS that is that is on the car, right? So the car manufacturers today have GPS sensors on the car so they know where they are, but it's it's accuracy, let's say, is typically plus or minus. It could be you know, 10 to 30 feet, which isn't very helpful and for certain types of research. 
However, when you're crowds, if so one, any one sensor is only so accurate, but then when you're crowdsourcing the data, you have in multiple cars, let's say cars driving up and down the lanes in New York City, you know, when you have hundreds of them, you can start using that information to better understand where the actual drivable path is and where the lanes are and the fact that we can see the road edges. So we see road edges, we see crosswalks, we see the, the lane markings. So you start building this road geometry that's pretty spatially very accurate against each other. Now, where you put it exactly on a map to the true like ground truth information, there's some work that you could do to, to align it to you know, ground control points in known areas. So what Mobileye does, it'll take much, lots of information and then align it basically to get to better GPS accuracy than just any one individual sensor that, you know, it could be based on where the satellites are that day or whether the buildings are blocking it or whatever. So hopefully that helps. It's, we benefit from uh, more information than, than one, any one individual sensor. That's very helpful. I think definitely, you know, it will base on the fleet size, the scale of the, the data that collected from the network. But I really like the idea about the ground control points that you mentioned. I think that might be very good, um, um, you know, way of uh, kind of like doing like checkpoint or certain, you know, um, to, to, to make sure to ensure that the data is accurate. Uh, for different area. So this, I think the next question is actually related to this one as well. Uh, this is from Hella, and she was asking, you know, are AVs easier to test in certain areas? You know, for example, come if we compare New York City with Israel, like do, do different types of transportation infrastructure actually affect AV performance? Uh, yes, it does. And, and, and for us, it's it's been a challenge because the signage Right in the in the United States, this is talking about signs. There's a MUTCD, this is model for uniform traffic control device. So stop signs and should look and smell the same in the U.S. You know, across all 50 states. But then cities will have their own individual signs, like you can't park on this side of the street for garbage day or whatever. So we we don't read all signs, and it's not like it's it's, it's reading everything perfect. And an example would be if you're on the Brooklyn Bridge there may be a directional sign. So we know it's a directional sign, but we don't know what it says. Um, and, and so across the, the world, different signs mean different things. So we've had to train AI across many different countries and many different states to have the, the core ones for autonomous driving. So that's just from a, the AI requirements in us is exponential because of different signs in different areas. And then when you get into the visibility, you know, whether you have a high speed road versus, you know, a, an urban road or, a, a, you know, inner city where people are driving slower, but it's more congested. So I think when you have much more congestion, you have many more trajectories and things happening that you're looking at to make sure your car doesn't, doesn't uh, crash. But from a, a data perspective, it's, you know, what are you collecting? And so on that, we actually, all the cars that are, say, driving around the country, if we just collected every car every second, every, you know, every day of the week, we'd just be really, you know, I think now we're doing 19 million miles a day or something of collection, but it would just be tremendous. So we actually can throttle the collection rates on what we're collecting. So like in New York City, if we were doing a study, we can turn every, turn the throttle wide open if you're doing a vulnerable road user study or something else. But it's, I think the number, the density of cars you have, the collection rate of the data that's coming in, and then obviously the resolution of the sensors you have all play a role in, you know, whether it's easy in one area versus somewhere else. So in New York City, we have dense, lots of cars. So that helps us where we can have an, like Montana or something, we don't have it's very wide open, but we don't have that many cars. So we actually probably do a worse job in Montana because we don't know the roads as well. Mm, that makes sense. And, you know, just since, since we've been talking about this data that generated, there's a question actually related to the video data. I mean, the computer vision data that are collected. Um, do you like, you know, are there any, I would say like, are you doing anything to like, do you actually use this vision-based data to create the actual map message, you know, like SAE standard map message 
um, right now, or is that something on your roadmap uh, that you're planning to do that in the future? To say, explain that better. Uh, what do you mean by the message or the road message? Uh, so let's say we have all these standard SAE message, like, you know, SPAT message, which is, you know, um, putting the signal information in that, right? And there's also map message, which is transmitting the geometry of the road, um, that type of information. And I think this question, the call is ready to ask, since mobile is collecting all these infrastructure-based road geometry information, are you actually turning them into the exact map message that can be used you know, for the connected automated vehicle right now? Or is something that you plan maybe on a roadmap that in the future, I'm going to turn all this data into the standard map message? Yeah, so if I heard your question right, so, so one of them is, as we're driving the roads, we're collecting this information, some of the car manufacturers we work with like Volkswagen and BMW and Ford will actually push when you, if you have a, a newer Ford and you want to get the navigation map, so we're pushing that map uh, almost, you know, I don't know what the update frequency is, but it's updated very often directly into the car. And now you could say, why well, my Google Maps works fine or my Waze works fine, but, you know, we're pushing this information, you know, to the car manufacturers for that navigation experience. Um, and then the closest example, I think, to Janie, what you're asking is, in Europe right now, it, it's mandated that the cars have to know the legal speed limit and display that in car, right? And, and so the cars basically, as you're driving down the road, they'll, they'll see a 70 mile an hour speed limit or 35 mile, whatever it is. And so then that's transmitted to where it shows. So then your car lights up if you're speeding. And some of you may experience that if you use Waze, you'll see when you're speeding, it'll show a little speed limit sign that will turn it red. So that's, I would say, that's the first example of where a car is reading stuff and then and displaying it for a driver, you know, and this one happens to be from a regulated perspective. So as you can imagine, a work zone is coming or foggy weather is coming. So I think this is sort of the early little baby steps of what's to come. So some, someone asked a question about the cost of these sensors so that the sensor themselves that's put into a, a new Ford or BMW, you know, very low cost, little simple cameras, one megapixel, like compared to your iPhone, it's trash, <laughs> but it's, it's designed for collision avoidance. So it's, it's, it works perfectly for that purpose. Um, the aftermarket, which the full package to have a heads up display and alerting system that we put into like service and delivery trucks and cable companies. It's, it's under a thousand dollars. So it, it's a low cost. Um, but it's, it's not something like, you know, as a mobile employees, we get one to put in our car. So if we want one, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool, but it's, you know, it's really more for commercial than a consumer experience. And the, the way consumers get the experience is built into the newer cars. So it's better to join Mobileye to get a free one. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Add to your old car, <laughs> if, right. if you have a car. Yeah. And I guess I would just keep one last question, which I would like to direct to both Mark, you and Zilin. Uh, I know someone was asking a question about work zone, and I want to extend that question a little bit, because I know, you know, Mobileye is doing all this work using computer vision-based system to detecting work zone in real time. And I know Zilin have done a lot of research on, you know, predicting work zone duration and how to coordinate like multiple work zones um, for, for New York State. And I think in the future, it is kind of natural that we can combine all these together for better, you know, smart works on management. So just wondering like what perspective you have on integrating all these different features or functions for, you know, better managing work zones are um, these features that I just mentioned, like predicting durations, better coordination already on your roadmap for that. Yeah, so we, we currently will, when we see a work zone, if we've seen it three times, I think it's three or five, five times in a given 24 hours, then the indication will come on and then it sets to expire if it doesn't see more indications over, I think the same sort of frequency over the next 24 hours. So we're, we're turning the, that on and off. And so that, that exists today. The, the question that someone asked, the last question was, um, 
the, you know, drivers will react. They may or may not slow down when they see the sign that, or they're going to divert their car because they're like, you know, say there's a lane diversion or something. So the, the GPS trace and the, let's say the telematics of the car sees, you know, the impacts of a work zone. You also see the speed indications. One that uh, unique one that Mobileye measures is the headway, right? So you, you if they basically the, the work zone is, is not only slowing people down, but in making it congested, we measure the headway. So that might be a, a neat research opportunity to look at headway around work zones, but then the harsh braking, harsh cornering, collision warning events, those things obviously are a real concern if, if that's happening. Um, do those warnings reduce the efficiency of the traffic system? So I'm trying to think of how to answer that. Do the warnings, well, I, I guess the warnings would be as if it, it's more of a safety indication. So we, you want those warnings to go off, um, but how to optimize a work zone to not, you know, that, that's the whole trick is, is how can I have work zones that don't slow my traffic or don't cause safety issues. And that's a whole research opportunity in itself, I would say. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's always trade-off between mobility and safety, right? And I yeah. think that's, I mean, of course, the, the ultimate goal is trying to improve mobility um, as well as safety and private safety go first. Um, but um, there might be some occasion, you know, certain ITS technology, certain, you know, CV, AV technology may slow down the traffic or at the cost of slowing traffic slightly between that. But I agree with you. I think that's a research topic that there's a lot of researchers are still kind of digging on that topic, see like how we balance it, what is the best trade off between them. And yeah. I want to. I want to throw this question to Zili as well. There's one other question I just wanted to do so we don't miss the other person's question about the VDEX. You know, that's going to take the time for VDEX. One is because think of as mobile, at least on the data side, we're an ingredient. So there's there's a number of startups, there's a number of companies that are, you know, especially in the ITS space that are leading in having connected vehicles talk to the infrastructure and, and you know, whether it's just about speed limit signs or work zones, I think that's a an area of growth. Um, and so we're, you know, we're trying to have our data help that process, you know, advance properly um, versus we're not leading it. You know, we're, we're contributing to it. it uh, hopefully that helps that answer that question. For sure. All right. I think we're almost at the time. So I would like to, you know, just give uh, maybe the last few minutes. Um, Maybe to Zilin, because I haven't got that chance to ask Zilin about the question. Zilin, do you have anything else you would like to share with the audience, uh, your experience about work zones, you know, to my previous question asking about if there's any perspective on like work zone management improvement using all these emerging and great technology that Mark mentioned that mobile is doing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So talking about the uh, work zone management. Uh, so basically, when I'm doing my research, there are two major topics that I'm uh, caring about. So basically, the first one is on the macroscopic level, uh, like how the work zone is kind of like uh, causing the negative impact to the whole transportation system, uh, considering like the congestion or the delay for the traffic flow. And for the microscopic level for each individual vehicles, like what kind of like the slowdown or like how you can avoid, if you know, like uh, by, based on some like uh, the pre uh, for, uh, for it had notice or like the message sent up to the vehicle, can you try to avoid the work zone? Uh, since you like other vehicles detect the work zone uh, occurrence on that road. So you kind of have this uh, uh, detour or like reroute to like different locations to avoid that. So yeah, basically I think these uh, questions can be answered using like the new technologies bring by the mobile and like the, uh, especially like the vision based uh, technologies for the work zones. So yeah, that, that's, that's definitely a big hit for that. Great. And Mark, do you have any words you want to share, especially maybe do you have any quick advice to the students who might be interested in this field just before we wrap up everything? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I worked for six years with the academic sector more. This was around climate change research and it was great working with researchers in the different universities. But one is, you know, there's, there's small companies and large companies, I think, you know, you're to really wear lots of hats and get experience. There's a lot of startup companies if you're interested in the transportation space that you can you know, start using your studies and the stuff you're doing almost immediately. 
and get your hands wet and, and get a lot of good experience. You know, I've, I spent eight years out in the Silicon Valley area, but it's, it happens in New York, it happens all over. And I think, you know, getting involved with the Transportation Research Board, TRB, there's, I mean, so many committees and groups and efforts that and any topic you're interested in, I'm sure there's a group that you can be part of to learn yeah. more and, and advance that. So I think use the resources at NYU and, and within the, the ecosystem as well, just to get some exposure and experience to, to find what you like and, and to advance your career. Yeah.